Welcome you all to the Azadi ka Am to the Azadi ka Amrut Mahotsav series. We have a very special guest with us today who is going to share with us the history of Godrej and its contribution to the economic development of India. This session is sure to widen our frame of reference. It yields insights into the development of Indian economy, of industry structures, and of course, business strategies. I'm sure you all are excited to know how the first generation's vision still continues, eth ethical values and the corporate governance style of Godrej, its success, its failures in making strategies, and how all of this will contribute to our understanding of business management. So without further ado, let's start with a welcome address by our beloved director, Dr. Smita Shukla, ma'am. Ma'am, over to you. Smita ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. See, I can hear you, but I think Smita ma'am, we are unable to hear her. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah? Okay. So... Um, all right, ma'am. Uh... Okay, uh, so Mansi, uh, go ahead with the further part. We will connect with Smita ma'am once again. Um, yeah ma'am, sure. So uh, moving on, I would request our today's program convener, Dr. Uh, Kavita Pandey ma'am, to introduce today's theme. Smita ma'am, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, yes, ma'am. We request you to have your welcome address. I'm not able to hear anything. Okay. Uh, Kavita, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Your voice is coming to us. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, yes, I am not able to hear you all. So I'll continue. If I'm audible, no, I'll continue because at least the purpose is getting served. And that is why I was not in sync with whatever was going on because I couldn't hear only. So uh, first of all, on behalf of the institution, I welcome uh, Vrinda Pathare, Madam, for giving consent to speak today to the management the students and also the participants, invited participants who are interested in knowing more about this topic. The topic is extremely, extremely relevant uh, because when we refer to uh, 75 years of completion of uh, uh, you know, uh, our independence, there is so much uh, in, in history which we still uh, little know about. And specifically when we refer to business history there is such little awareness which is existing in India regarding you no know, uh, business history of uh, various business houses whether business houses themselves are sensitive enough and do realize the importance of documenting business history even that is one dilemma which I hold just to share a narrative yesterday I was in another city um, the city is Kanpur, from where the house of Singhania's JK house started. Uh, uh, this, this business group is known most for the Raymond brand. And they uh, started their business journey from the city of Kanpur. 
uh, where their original setup is located in one of uh, no very uh, what should i say uh, tiny and extremely crowded lanes of kanpur and yesterday when i was standing in front of that house uh, i i thought that why can't i visit so i went inside the premises and i requested that can i uh, visit your uh, viewing gallery if you have any they said no we don't have any viewing gallery i said can i at least click picture from inside that i am in front of this no historical building they said no no that is not permitted so i realized ki there is very little awareness about no understanding business history and no appreciating that how if you document it and open it to public how the contribution of a business house a business group can be understood in that context whatever vrinda madam has been doing and i have been reading about her she is an archivist we all know now her designation and the work she has done but she has been talking on various forums on this topic she is extremely what should i say she is extremely committed to this cause she has spoken on various forums whether it is kala ghoda arts festival whether it is various colleges she has spoken about the importance of documenting oral history she has spoken about uh, 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 corporate history documentation uh, and and uh, we are very keen to uh, understand from her her journey and looking forward to what she has to state today uh, madam welcome and thank you uh, once again for giving your consent to address the audience today on this delightful topic thank you smita ma'am thank you for your kind words and a warm welcome mm. kavita ma'am and now i would request you to introduce today's theme so that we can carry on with the program yes thank you so much uh, mansi i am here today to just uh, give the brief introduction that why we have decided to have a session on this particular topic under azadi ke amrit mahotsav a uh, guest lecture series uh, i am very thankful first and foremost to dr smita shukla and the institution for giving me lots of opportunities to explore uh, my ideas in terms of new sessions to be initiated at the institution as we all know that the nation is celebrating the azadi ka amrit mahotsav which is an initiative of the government of india to celebrate and commemorate the 75 years of independence and the glorious history of its people culture and achievements this mahotsav is dedicated to the people of india who have not only been instrumental in bringing india but also hold within them the power and potential to enable the spirit of atmanirbhar bharat in the words of firoza godrej who is an art historian environmentalist and writer i quote it is an accepted fact that our roots genesis and past play a powerful role in determining our present as also our future by the same token organizational history is an indispensable requirement for regularly defining the crucial exercise of strategic planning more so in the current malu which offers an abundance of competitive opportunities for the super qualified to climb up the corporate ladder hence records of all aspects successes as well as failures serve as a guiding lights to help steer an organization into the future archives not only serve as a storehouse for sorting out selective and historically important documents they are vehicles to effectively disseminate and convey to the world the contribution made by business houses to the country in the particular and to society at large godrej archives is the business archives of godrej group the archives collects preserves and manage records covering 125 years of the company's history it was established in the year 1997 by mr sohra godrej the former chairman of godrej group who was a very enthusiastic and proactive in terms of collecting relevant documents and photographs 
to record the history of Godrej, its products, plants, and people following state of the art standards and practices. The objective behind to organize today's guest lecture series is to encourage discussions on uncharted areas in Indian business history. So as a lifelong learner of history and management, I affirmatively believe that there is a strong need to learn about the history of business, which helps to gain knowledge, wisdom, organizational policies and practices, and the contribution made by industrialists for bringing change in India's economy. In view of the above, it is my privilege to welcome Brinda Patare Ma'am, the head Godrej Archives of Godrej Group India. Now I request my placement committee member, Mansi, to kindly give a brief introduction about matter. Over to you, Mansi. Thank you, ma'am. I am elated to introduce you to our today's speaker, Ms. Vrinda Pathari, ma'am, who is the head of Godrej Archives. Apart from, apart from being an experienced archivist, she is also serving president of Oral History Association of India, the secretary of section of Business Archives of International Council of Archives, and a member of steering committee for Dr. Avabhai Vadia and Dr. Bomanji Kurshedji Vadia Archives for Women. In the past, she has also served as a member of advisory board of Raj Bhavan Archives of Government of Maharashtra and has also been a member of IIM Ahmedabad Archive Committee. Ms. Runda has authored a monograph titled Arthur Bedford or Liber Founders and Guardians of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, published in 2018 as a part of the Asiatic Society monograph series. Presently, Ms. Vrinda is on the Board of Studies for Department of History at Ruya College, Guru Nanak Thalsa College, and SNDT Women's University in Mumbai. She has been a resource person at many national workshops and has presented papers on aspects of archiving and on business archives at both national as well as international conferences. Her research and archiving experience combined with her academic qualification in history and records management has greatly contributed to the efficient working of Godrej archives. There is much to speak, but I'm sure we all are excited to learn more directly from ma'am. So let's start with our session. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Smita Shukla, the director of at the Alkesh Dinesh Modi Institute, uh, and also Dr. Kavita Pandey for inviting me today. And it's really a great pleasure, especially to talk about Godrej, especially in its 125th year. Uh, Godrej recently completed on 7th May 125 and uh, you know it, it's really when one tries to actually really dig deeper uh, into the reasons why actually such companies have endured for say uh, you know centuries more than a century uh, one actually realizes that it is actually the core strengths of the company uh, also the DNA which are the value systems that these kind of companies have really evolved over a period of time that actually really inspire such companies to thrive for uh, this kind of, you know, a span of life. And therefore, actually, one must realize that, you know, uh, we are usually like, you know, involved in doing the SWOT analysis, but the one strength that actually every company has uh, is its legacy and the history. And uh, Dr. Smita Shukla also pointed out that not many companies have realized this strength and, uh, you know, and one must really realize because depending on how actually the companies look at history, whether they look at history as, you know, like a roadblock or whether they look at history as a rear view mirror, which can actually constantly guide them to, uh, you know, in their journey to the future. I think that's where, uh, you know, the uh, company's future is also decided because uh, if the companies can actually use history as a tool, I think it is uh, going to really help them in understanding the strategies and take more kind of informed decisions. And uh, therefore, it is really exciting to talk about this um, in your series. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. 
And in 2006, when I was, you know, when I started actually setting up the Godrej archives, uh, I started up reading like, you know, more on business history and its evolution uh, as a branch of, you know, academics, especially in India. And I realized that the very foundation of business history was actually laid uh, at the management institute. You know, I am Ahmedabad was the one which actually pioneered business history uh, in India. And hence, I was really thrilled to, uh, you know, speak today at another management institute, which, wa which was actually showing very keen interest in business history. Uh, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, discuss uh, about business history and business archiving with all the students who have, uh, you, who are actually part of this audience today. Uh, you know, and I, I strongly believe that business history, uh, you know, should be actually taught, uh, you know, in the future management courses as well. Uh, and, uh, and I also like, you know, sincerely hope that, you know, your institute also takes this up soon. Uh, what I will be doing today is basically, um, you know, I'll plan to take you all through the journey of business history and business archiving as well, because one must understand from where it all began. And then I will actually talk about archiving Godrej history and how, uh, you know, we experienced that the whole Godrej narrative wasn't really confined to just one company, but actually it can, it has the power to tell actually a really kind of a larger narrative, a na larger national story uh, to tell. So, you know, so let's start with actually understanding the roots of business history and business archive. Uh, I would be just uh, switching off my video just for the bandwidth thing. Uh, so yeah, so let's start with understanding, uh, you know, where actually it start, started, why basically the business archives are really very important. Uh, the post-globalization scenario, if you like look at in our country, uh, we have all, you know, witnessed the accelerated economic growth. There was rapid urbanization. A uh, lot of infrastructural, uh, you know, projects were taken up. There was lots of emphasis uh, soon after the independence on science, technology, industrial development. Uh, and also in the recent past, we have also seen, uh, you know, the growth of information technology. And all this actually in no time has also led to the whole transformation of not only our values and beliefs, but also our identities as a community, as a nation, uh, may it be cultural, national, environmental, institutional, or even at the individual le uh, level, we have actually uh, changed as a consumer, we have changed as an individual, our tastes have changed over a period of time. But if you like, you know, think about how our history is going to be remembered, you know, means we have been remembering lots of people from the past, but if you look at like what we are doing today, uh, you know, how does one then really choose to remember all these and, you know, how we can also like at the same time retain the identity in this whole, uh, you know, fast changing world. And this is where actually the legacy and history or the institutions like archives or museums play uh, a very important role because identity is really very closely uh, you know, related to the shared past, a shared memory, and memory can be in different forms, you know, it can be tangible, uh, it can, like, you know, monuments that you see is also a memory, it can be intangible, like the stories that have been shared by generations, um, and these are the uh, memories, uh, intangible forms that actually then, you know, remain as the points of our reference, and as historian, we call it sources, uh, but these are basically what gives you the sense of continuity. You know, we, we actually then can feel belonging to a particular period. Um, and therefore, it is really very necessary, not just for the nation, but also for an organization or even an institution or even like a university, uh, which is an institution to actually record, uh, you know, their thought process, you know, how they have evolved over a period of time, what kind of learnings they had. Uh, you know, achieved, you know, through, throughout their journey, what they have learned, what they have given back to the society, all this actually should be recorded. It can be through documents, it can be through manuscript, letters, photos, uh, and even in the, you know, in today's world, even like the social media blogs, uh, or even emails, everything actually reflect on what we are doing. And I think, you know, we must really think about how we can actually 
record this information that we are creating on such a rapid uh, pace and also you know it's almost like we are bombarded with information overload every day and we must seriously really now think that how we are going to be remembered uh, by the future generations because um, this information if not saved today uh, is going to otherwise disappear and be forgotten and then there would be you know no history of us and therefore uh, you know we must think about like archives are also very important not just from the national history point of view but also from the institutional or the corporate uh, point of view as well because uh, you know institutionalization of information is not really very common in india you know we don't give due attention to the documentation and hence therefore we find ourselves fighting for the patents like haldi because we have never really paid attention to uh, documenting every detail uh, and businesses are no exception to this um, however businesses are now also responsible uh, to nation people and also the environment besides their capital stock and stake shareholders and therefore uh, every organization regardless uh, of its size uh, you know, which is amassing a wealth of knowledge over time. And, you know, even individual experiences of employees who are dealing with different kinds of situation uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, if you actually join together and piece all these stories together, uh, they actually are very important company specific knowledge. And this is the organizational knowledge that you also might be studying in your courses. And this is the know-how, this is the individual skills and insights and experiences. This is kind of a sum which really needs to be, uh, you know, preserved. And these are valuable assets of any company because it provides answers to different kinds of business specific questions that aren't always covered by formal education and training. You have to go to a certain employee to understand what kind of problems that he or she might have faced. And then you learn from their experience, you know, not everything will be recorded in a file, not everything there will be the in the manual. So even if there is a manual or the SOPs have been written in the corporates, you need people, you need people's knowledge to understand what exactly, you know, really made this company go forward, take up the challenges, overcome the challenges, etc. And this knowledge is very unique for every corporate. And that becomes really a kind of a differentiative factor, even when you're doing any brand building. So, and especially, you know, it will set that uh, organization apart from the other companies. Um, and this is the knowledge which will be really very useful, especially in the competitive environment to tell what are the strengths of this company, why this company, uh, you know, stands uh, and it, it is different from the other companies. Uh, and plus, businesses are now responsible to the nation, people, and therefore it is imperative for every uh, corporate house to preserve the corporate memory by archiving their activities in an organized manner so that this information is available for the future. And over the last decade, we have been seeing uh, a steady growth in the general awareness for say preservation and the use of business records and more and more companies are now actually coming forward, contemplating to set up the archive. And undoubtedly, you know, archives uh, will not only assist the company to sort or organize their, uh, you know, historically important records or their organizational knowledge, but it will also play an important role in communicating to the outside world what is the contribution of this business house to the country, its society, and its people. And um, Therefore, today, you know, uh, you know, I will also discuss about the corporate archives as a form of organizational memory and how really they reflect uh, a wider historical industrial corporate memory of a nation. And I will, of course, use the Godrej case and the Godrej experience uh, to talk about that. But let's first understand the, uh, you know, genesis of the archives and especially the business archives uh, in India. Now, so to say, uh, if I may use this word scientification of history, uh, it actually took place around 19th century. And uh, around this period, actually the much emphasis was put on the idea that if you have to really write the true history, it has to be based on the critical appraisal of the authentic or textual source material from the past. 
and it is around this 19th century that a lot of people a lot of historians started uh, emphasizing more on the written records uh, and uh, especially there was an opening sentence of the uh, introduction or etudes historics published in 1898 by charles victor he actually echoed this idea that became actually kind of an anchor point in the scientific historiography and this uh, whole emphasis on documents uh, for true writing of history uh, that actually necessitated the methodical and systematic collection of these documents at a single place and the whole modern notion of archive uh, you know comes into the picture uh, so this is basically how actually the whole uh, approach towards the historiography the change in that actually leads to uh, more emphasis on the written document and the whole uh, importance of the archives as such <coughs> um, and but however if you look at India uh, we were not really averse to the record keeping because idea of archives in the modern sense of course was introduced to us uh, and the product of the colonial period but in India the tradition of archiving memory goes a long way and lots of travelogues if you see you will see uh, you know maybe ancient or medieval period, we find references to the records. Uh, records office, which are um, known as Nilopita, uh, is actually mentioned by Yuan Sang, the Chinese pilgrim who came to India around 630 to 644 during this period. And he says where, you know, that in Nilopita is the space where good or bad are recorded and instances of calamity or good fortune are set forth in details. That's what he says. Uh, even Arthashastra mentions Akshapatala, which is the office of accounts, which will have basically the records of, uh, you know, whatever has been produced by the king's administration. Uh, even Shukraniti has, uh, you know, mentioned that no business of the state was done without a written document. Uh, even in Vijayanagar, uh, Abdul Razak, who had visited Vijayanagar Empire in 1442, he also mentions uh, Divan Khana or minister's office. And he said that there was a raised gallery where the records were kept. Even Akbar Nama mentions Daftar Khana, uh, you know, which will have all the uh, records of the administration again. So uh, the whole tradition of maintaining records is also evident during Maratha period and Peshwa Daftar. Even today, if you go to Pune, Peshwa Daftar has amazing administrative papers of uh, Peshwas. But if you see, uh, even though this idea was there, uh, the idea of archives in the modern sense only germinated in the colonial period and in 1891 uh, on the recommendation of the civil auditor uh, to transfer all the records of the government to a grand central arsenal the imperial department was established in calcutta and after the uh, capital was shifted from uh, you know calcutta to delhi even this department shifted to new delhi in 1911 and uh, after independence this department was known as national archives uh, of India and they are in uh, Delhi at Jan on Janfat. Uh, but till recently, if you look at the whole concept of archives, it was only restricted to the government records. And uh, even the enactments like say Public Records Act of 1993 only cover the public records, that is government records and business records. Uh, and they, uh, you know, they do not mention any regulations related to the records of private enterprises uh, because they were never the concern of the archiving world. But it was only <coughs> sorry, uh, with the emergence of business history uh, as a separate discipline in 1960s uh, that the critical writing of corporate past made its beginning. And uh, the due credit has to be given to Dr. Dvijendra Tripathi, who joined as an assistant professor of business history at Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and he played a pioneering role. And uh, I would recommend reading all the books that he had actually published. And he also has like Oxford History of Indian Business, which I think is the basic uh, kind of a book to like start uh, with uh, if one needs to really understand the business history of India. Uh, at this time, now, why actually this happened at, uh, you know, Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad particularly, uh, and therefore we must actually look into uh, the founding of business history um, as an individual and academic pursuit 
uh, how actually it got established internationally. And uh, the credit must be given to Wallace Donham, who served as a dean of the Harvard Business School from 1919 to 1942. So Harvard Business School actually has a great tradition of business history, almost a century old tradition of business history, uh, because they believe in the case study uh, approach to the management studies. And uh, if you have to like create cases of different kinds of businesses, uh, you need to go uh, and you know dig deeper into their records. And that's how the case histories would be written of each and every company, which then will be used <coughs> as a literature for teaching the management uh, students. Uh, sorry, my throat is actually not well, so I would be taking pauses. <coughs> So he, um, so Donham actually believed that only historical insight into the past business dealings could give business students an idea of how to operate successfully in the business field. And during his tenure, Harvard rose to the center for the world of business history. Now, during this period, uh, business history remain, remained confined to company history, but then the arrival of Alfred Chandler Jr. on the scene in mid 50s brought uh, in a more comprehensive approach to the study of business. And by 1960s, business historians started reconsidering the definition of business history and broadened the meaning and the scope of business history beyond company history. Now, this was the same time when business education laid its foundation uh, you know, in India with the creation of Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad in 1961. Uh, and there was an initial collaboration <coughs> with the Harvard Business School. Uh, and they also, IMA also was influenced by the Institute's approach to education uh, through case studies. And the new course in the subject of business history was introduced. And uh, Dr. Dvijendra Tripathi, a business historian, of course, was appointed then. And he soon realized that business history is not really adequately written in absence of records and encourage businessmen and business houses to preserve their records. Because what he observed was that the literature available on the subject, if one needs to really write a case on business, uh, it, he realized that literature is not really substantial. So you can see that there were <coughs> lots of mercantile tailings, merchant family genealogies were available, jati histories, community histories were available. There were also a lot of biographical writings on the entrepreneurs. There were also Smriti Granth or Abhinanda Granth, which were like commemorative texts for a particular entrepreneur or a particular business family. So all these things was there, but they were not really uh, sufficient enough to, uh, or the substantial enough to talk about the business and the, uh, you know, uh, you cannot really uh, do historical inquiries into business uh, just on the basis of this. Uh, the other literature mostly consisted of biographies or memoirs of prominent businessmen or souvenir volumes, which usually the companies only publish. However, these works, if you know company themselves is publishing a biography or a company history, it definitely suffers from narcissism because there is there will be a lack of objectivity as they will be written in most cases <coughs> by either businessmen themselves or the authors who are commissioned by the company. And therefore, really, you cannot really rely on everything that is being said over there. <coughs> so what happened was, <coughs> in 1966, uh, in the 37th session of the Indian Historical Records Commission, the first ever discussion was held on the sources and problems of business history in India. And business records created by business houses um, constitute the valuable source material, but they were not really easily available for the researcher is what everyone really agreed upon. Now, reason for their unavailability is twofold. Uh, first, the indifference on part of business houses to upkeep of records and information, because that's not the priority. Of course, with now concepts like business excellence or ISO, they have to maintain certain records, but then these are almost like lots of things are like technical records that have been kept or like financial records that have been kept, but there is no kind of a system in any company whereby you can choose a very historically important record other than all these things which are actually 
uh, mandatory by law to keep for certain years. Uh, they don't really have a system of like collecting these kind of records. And <clears throat> so thus the absence of, and secondly, actually, you know, if at all they have collected the records, they are really not available for everyone to access it because they will be closely guarded in the strong rooms of the business houses. And hence they will be definitely out of uh, reach of researchers. So thus the absence of the organized archives of business houses in India provides an explanation for the reluctance of scholars also to take up these kind of histories, you know, because uh, because there is no records easily available, not a not lot of business histories have been written uh, in India. Uh, but Dr. Tripathi's persistent effort actually led to this resolution, which actually stated that all necessary steps should be taken to identify the list of business houses that may be willing to make their records available for research or if they require any help in matter of cataloging or preserving so that these holdings are easily accessible by researchers. So <clears throat> that was his great contribution. And by this time, actually, there was already uh, a business archive has come up, which was Tata Group of Companies had established Tata Central Archives at Pune and also Tata Iron and Steel archives had come up at Jamshedpur. Godrej was also set, you know, planning to set up the archives around that time uh, because the whole idea had germinated when they were celebrating centenary in 1997. Uh, so the first business archives was started when Tata Group of Companies established Tata Central Archives in 1991. Tata Iron and Steel came up in 93. Godrej, uh, you know, thought of establishing in 1997, but formally started in 2006. Among the banking sector, if you see Reserve Bank of India uh, is actually the oldest archives, which started in 1981, which uh, it is also uh, in Pune. And then State Bank of India archives and museum located in Calcutta was started in 2007. And around this time, National Archives also realized the relevance of business record. And then they also organized a seminar in 2008 to discuss the prospects for business archives in India. And if you see over the last decade, uh, last two decades, I would say, <coughs> sorry, there has been a growing interest in preservation of business records. And uh, almost actually 50 companies, uh, including banks actually, uh, you know, were present at the International Conference on Business Archives that was organized by the Reserve Bank of India, uh, jointly with the International Council of Archives and National Archives of India. In 2017, when Godrej organized the similar conference, there were already six, seven companies that have initiated setting up of their archives. And uh, if you see today, we have Sipla, a global pharmaceutical company, which has set up their archives in Mumbai Central. In 2014, we have DCM Shriram, uh, Dr. Reddy's, Wipro, Brajaj. They also now have the archives. Uh, Birla's have just uh, started at Taloza and even Kirloskar is, I think, work in progress. Uh, but if you see, because considering that there are 58 top Indian companies that have been listed in the Forbes Global 2000 ranking for, say, 2017, and even among the those which are not listed on this list, many have completed 50 years of their existence, and still we do not have archives of these companies who have completed 50 years. Uh, so therefore, it is still a challenge to establish the value of the archives for business environment and for the business archivists in India. Uh, so now I would just, uh, you know, quickly take you through how Godrej archives started. So as I was telling you, in the centenary year in 1997, Sorab Godrej, uh, the chairman of Go the Godrej group then, he envisioned archives to be a heritage center offering invaluable archival material for reference and research. And this is really great because he mentioned that it would be available for reference and research, which is quite a great thing to do because otherwise, you know, records are usually treated as a closely guarded secrets by lots of corporates. And then in 2006, of course, we started, uh, you know, laying down the policies. We also like laid down the processes. And now there is kind of a regular, uh, you know, flow of our activities uh, to manage the whole organizational knowledge of the company. 
and uh, from 2006 we have been constantly and we have been the official collectors uh, of the Godrej company records we document we preserve uh, we also try and communicate histories that are hidden in these records uh, to the outside world and we do this through survey and transfer of old records constantly we do this uh, we also like keep interviewing a lot of people uh, we have now interviewed more than 300 people, uh, employees in our company, including, of course, dealers as well, uh, you know, just to record their experiences. Uh, we also uh, have a dedicated cataloging unit. We have a storage space because all this is needed when you are actually archiving the history uh, of any institution. And then we also, to take care and conserve these records, we now have a dedicated digital lab as well as a conservation lab. Uh, so this is what basically uh, we do. Uh, but when actually, um, you know, we were actually going through this record or whenever we are actually collecting these records, we realized that um, we were gathering not just the story of the corporate through records, but the stories of individuals who keep impacting the products. Uh, or even processes of business who are also affected by every product and the business strategy. So what we do is basically we are trying to understand the history of products, history of people, and history of processes and people uh, that make the Indian corporate world. And they can be consisting of entrepreneurs, designers, engineers, suppliers, workers, dealers, distributors, uh, even the market, the consumers. Uh, all these individuals collectively, if you start, you know, thinking about their stories, they are actually part of this whole corporate narrative because corporations are not going to function in isolation. They too operate in social spaces and no one can deny the influence that the business has on lives of its own employees and stakeholders, but also on its consumers and their patterns of consumption. In turn, even these societies the values and the economic developments from the outside world, they will also be constantly impacting. So there will be always this give and take between the corporate and the society around or the environment around. And that is very interesting to look at when you're looking at any corporate uh, history. And uh, uh, that's when we actually realize that, you know, we need to be more inclusive and all these stories should come. Uh, but now let's see how actually uh, you know, when we were looking at Godrej history, we actually started mapping even the national narrative around. <clears throat> so here it actually all began uh, because Godrej's story began as an individual's response to the Swadeshi spirit of the era. Uh, if you like, you know, go back to your school curriculums, you definitely must be remembering the Swadeshi movement. And that actually has not just and whenever we actually talk about Swadeshi moment, we only talk about the boycott of foreign goods. But then what were the alternatives available for our Indian consumers if we were boycotting foreign goods? That's when actually the different story comes into picture where entrepreneurs, Indian entrepreneurs were manufacturing those things and who were inspired and influenced by the whole Swadeshi spirit of the era that actually uh, you know, contributed to the pre- colonial, post-colonial industri post -colonial industrial activity uh, because they also dreamt of new resurgent India, self-reliant India. And uh, business archive collection at Godrej Archives not only captures these facets, uh, but it really highlights how actually such entrepreneurs and companies were responding to all these political and economic conditions or even these events that were taking place. Now here, there is only one interview that we have that Ardesh had ever given to the press. And here, if you can see, means today we talk about startups, but here he is talking about and you know asking the youth that why they cannot really come forward. He's using strong words, but he's actually asking them that why they can't come forward and contribute, uh, you know, and can see actually how the foreign exploiters are actually making us slaves of their taste and goods. So why, you know, you cannot come forward and start manufacturing. And this is the call he has given through this interview that was published in 1927 in Indian Herald. Um, <clears throat> so this is basically how the period actually really shaped lots of these entrepreneurs. And of course, Tata's were also there. 
there were many other companies which had showed this kind of an entrepreneurial uh, skills and you know because late 19th century saw the emergence of middle class and there was this growing sense of disillusionment with the british government and that found actually expression in the writings of dada bhai nauroji mg ranadi so people were reading these the youth was reading what the thoughts of dada bhai nauroji or mg ranadi was they were getting influence and these writings criticize the exploitation of indian resources for the benefit of great britain uh, and that actually instigated the growing sense of identity in indian business interests and the whole rising nationalist tendencies in society as a whole uh, and this is what actually dr dwijendra tripathi points out and he says that that actually provided a great deal of impetus to the idea of swadeshi or what we say economic autonomy the self reliance uh, and even the businessmen and industrialists could not really remain untouched by this swadeshi spirit of the era and ardeshir especially ardeshir godrej the founder of godrej group he was swayed in by dada bhai nauroji's writings uh, and his drain of wealth if you remember this book uh, actually talks about that and uh, ardeshir really strongly believed after reading his uh, writings uh, that political independence will be really meaningless without economic independence and in order to achieve this india must reduce its dependence on the west now with this belief he actually started manufacturing locks in the year 1897 and then of course he went on to make safes uh, and security equipment uh, and then of course created uh the godrej uh, toilet soaps from vegetable oil now adishar godrej papers at the godrej archives collection not only provide clues about this era that molded adishar beliefs but they also help us understand the relationship between indian businesses and the government before independence as well so in a way we were actually trying to be like self reliant but also all the businesses were also complying with all the western methods that actually made the businesses more organized like uh, ardeshir really flaunted in one of the catalogs of 1925 that you know they are using uh, really a great machinery the quality is good and their whole emphasis on quality is really striking and they are actually using really modern methods of even advertising uh, for safes he was actually ready to conduct the public fire test for his safe uh, you know lots of uh, burglary kind of taste also he had done in the public spaces so it is very interesting to see uh, you know this whole negotiation between the colonial uh, requirements and the indian businesses even though we were also fighting for uh, our freedom and uh, and lots of government uh, offices were also buying from these companies later but i'll come to that later and uh, and he was very conscious about the quality so they were following all the norms they were applying for patents they were participating in the exhibitions uh, and here on the screen actually you can see this uh, drawing that godrej submitted for securing the first patent which of course pirod shah uh, is in pirod shah godrej's name who was an engineer by training uh, ardeshir actually was a lawyer by training but he started this manufacturing uh, i won't go into the details why he came into manufacturing right now uh, but uh, but this is how actually these two brothers uh started but their constant emphasis on quality is something which is really very interesting to look at because what they believed was like even though it is the indian alternative that we are providing for the other products uh they shouldn't be considered inferior by anyone so it has to be like really matching the international quality so even though it is like you know indian alternative we are creating that doesn't mean that we are not creating a superior product and that's the emphasis which you actually can see in these manufacturers so they are following all the norms uh, they are as i was saying applying for patents uh, you know and they were you know uh, participating in exhibitions winning the awards in that and they were actually using lots of testimonials to their catalogs uh, which is a really interesting kind of uh, organization structure that you see even though it was a traditionally managed company then godrej only got incorporated in 1932 but till then it was a traditionally managed company and uh, they were still doing all these uh, you know managerial expectations that one has from the businesses 
uh, very efficiently even during this time. Uh, after locks and safes, uh, Ardeshar actually moved on to manufacture soaps. Uh, and that also again has a connection with the Swadeshi um, movement because Indian National Congress, uh, when they actually appealed to lots of you know, people to boycott the foreign goods. And at, around that time, around 1910, early 20th century, there was a lot of influx of foreign made soaps that was flooding the Indian markets. Realizing this, Indian National Congress made an appeal that we should boycott these foreign soaps. And uh, however, they also realized that we need an alternative to be created. So they also appealed to manufacturers, uh, you know, to have a kind of an alternative and they should start manufacturing soaps indigenously. And around this time, like, uh, you know, already in 1901, Bengal Chemicals had started. Uh, in 1918, around the same time when Ardeshar Godrej was making soaps with vegetable oil, Swastik oil mill started. So all these companies that were actually coming up uh, were actually the response to the Swadeshi movement and the response to the call that Indian National Congress was making that we need entrepreneurs to come forward and create this kind of a, a industry where we can actually make available the Indian alternatives as far as the consumer goods are concerned. And that's how actually it started. And of course, uh, initially we had Rabindranath Tagore, Annie Bazin, because they were the heroes of that time. And they were advertising for the Godrej soaps, which were considered to be Swadeshi soaps. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi's son also volunteered to sell soaps uh, as his contribution to the Swadeshi movement. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, film Gandhi, My Father, and that actually shows uh, Mahatma Gandhi's son selling the Godrej soaps. So this is how actually the manufacturers and companies have played their significant role even in the national movement. Of course, the heroes changed and around 50s, we have started seeing that lots of soap manufacturers started using the celebrities to advertise um, their product. And here is Madhubala advertising for Godrej Watni soap. Uh, in 1950s that you can see over here. But again, going back to the period when, uh, you know, lots of banking has actually also started gaining importance. So in around like late 19th century, already the uh, bank world has been established in the city of Mumbai. And uh, Central Bank of India, which was the first Indian commercial bank, uh, that was wholly owned and managed by Indians. And that is really very interesting to look at this development of banking sector also in India uh, is an another kind of an interesting historical narrative to uh, actually look at. And uh, so when they actually shifted to this building, if you have gone to Hutatma Chowk, you will see this building. Uh, so they moved to this building in 1921 and they came up with this little booklet, the new home of the Central Bank of India. And uh, because Godrej had supplied all the safes, which you can see on the right, at their cash counter, uh, you know, this booklet actually found its way to our Godrej archives collection. Now, this is really very interesting to look at how the banking sector and this product safe actually goes hand in hand. So both their stories really uh, align with each other. And therefore, to understand the product also means to understand a national narrative that was taking place in that particular time. Soon, the whole concept of safe vaults came and then the Godrej patent strong vault uh, became actually part of the bank. If even today, if you go to any nationalized bank, if you go to the vault, I don't know how many of you have seen the safe deposit vaults, but do go and check. You will still find lots of, uh, you know, Godrej patent strong vault doors and the vault rooms that were created by Godrej and supplied to these banks, um, you know, since 1930s. If you see like this is the Times of India article uh, from 1936, and this is basically, uh, you know, saying that the Godrej Patent Strong Vault at the Bank of India was actually established. Even the Surat's first safe deposit actually vault came for to which, uh, because if you look at even Gujarat and especially Surat, there are lots of these privately owned safe deposit vaults as well. And it is also very interesting to study, to look at that how people feel assured even to keep their things in a privately owned safe deposit vaults. And it is really amazing that even that began in 1930s because lots of diamond merchants were there 
and they couldn't really follow the bank timings. Therefore, all these privately owned safe deposit vaults actually came into the picture. And this is really very interesting thing to look at. And actually, uh, you know, this kind of a case study would be really very interesting to look at. Even at Karachi, there was a safe deposit wall. So if you see 30s, suddenly you see these kind of changes that were taking place in the uh, banking sector. And there is a company which is manufacturing these things and how they are responding. So how actually the products uh, and these kind of requirements that the market has actually goes hand in hand. So the product development, you cannot really uh, you know, look at in a very isolated kind of a uh, you know, way as well. You have to take all these things into consideration, how the market was behaving, what kind of consumer requirement actually popped up during that period. And then there is a product that is being launched to address those needs, which is a very interesting connection that one can actually get from these kind of stories. And then, of course, in 1927 and 28, uh, you know, this headline actually hit the Bombay Chronicle which said a triumph for Swadeshi venture, Godred saves replace European make in postal department. Now, what really happened during this period? Uh, because the period after World War I witnessed the change of attitude of the government, which was now willing to appease the native business instead of alienating it. Because this is the time when uh, British also had, you know, lots of industries were destroyed during the World War. They could not really... Uh, sustain themselves, the colonial rule could not sustain itself uh, just on the basis of the British industries they had, but they had to rely on the industries which were in their colonies. And at that same time, you can see all these appeasement, uh, you know, taking place, and they are now actually open to, uh, you know, buy things from even the Indian companies. And it is a very interesting compilation at the Asiatic Society Library that I found which was also done during that period. And Somerset Plain is the author who was asked and who was assigned the task of compiling the and document all the industries that were there in Bombay Presidency. And it's a huge volume. And I was actually wondering when I was looking at it that why it was you know, necessary to do this kind of a compilation. And that might be the reason where British wanted to understand that what are the kind of industrial strength the natives here have and how we can actually use those because now you know we cannot rely on our own industries which have been destroyed during the war so this is very interesting thing you know and these are the connections that one must actually look at to understand even a particular company's functioning and this was the time when of course godrej also backed this large order and then godrej became like a proper supplier to the british government from 1928 onwards and, uh, and this, of course, the article is really quite an interesting thing to uh, look at, therefore. Uh, around this time, uh, like around 1929, there was a Great Depression that took place in US and later the outbreak of Second World War that also compelled the complete transformation of the government's attitude. So it began with World War I, then they were compelled by the Great Depression and the World War II, and now, of course, uh, their whole attitude towards Indian industries and the war pressures increased the government's dependability on the Indian manufacturers. Now, this was the decade, like decade of 1930s, therefore, is again very important because it also witnessed the emergence of two industries in the state of Bombay. So if you look at the Gazetteer of India of 1987, you will find this reference that machine tools and automobiles, these were the two industries that came up and emerged during this particular period. And uh, till the beginning of the war, the machine tools were actually imported and opportunities opened on the eve of the Second World War for many Indian manufacturers, especially in machine tools industry, as government started placing large orders with the Indian firms like Kirloskar Brothers. So again, a very interesting company to look at. So Godrej tool room also was established during the same time, that is around 1935. Um, and Naval Godrej, the current uh, chairman, Jamshed Godrej's father, he was actually the lad of just 17 or 18 years old. And he was the one who took keen interest in setting up this tool room under the guidance of his father, Pirot Shah. 
and uh, you know it is around the same time so if you see like you know the tool industry is emerging and again you know godrej also is setting up their own uh, tool room for of course you know catering to their internal requirements and but this is how actually you see that there is a change in environment and the businesses keep responding uh, to these changes that are taking place around it and this is the tool room that actually paved the way for godrej to towards self reliance and that actually became the foundation for many products that godrej introduced later after independence which were never ever done by the any other indian companies before for example i'll come to that uh, made be a typewriter made be a forklift made be a refrigerator these three uh, they could introduce because they have established this tool room in 1935 and they have this core strength available uh, in house with them and uh, <clears throat> that's when actually pirotsha realized that uh, you know because godrej started in lalbag which was the heavy textile industry um, you know it was a, a textile you know all the textile mills were around and pirotsha was actually uh, you know ardeshwar and pirotsha had taken this small shed on a rent uh and had expanded their business over there but then there was no room for expansion there was already a lot of deindustrialization was happening in that area lots of industries were moving towards uh bombay agra road which is suburbs uh bombay agra road is today's lal bahadur shastri road that starts from kurla and connects up to like mulun uh on that whole stretch if you see even today if you go on that lbs road you will see all these remnants remnants of all the old industries that uh, you know started uh, being established over there uh, around 40s and 50s so you can actually also map the whole deindustrialization of the city of mumbai even through these godrej records that okay you know earlier the whole textile and the industrial zone was in parel and lalba it moved to the lbs road later in 50s and 60s and now it is now still moving uh, ahead you know uh to the other industrial zones that are being created and around this time pirot shah uh, realized that they also need to expand and go towards north and that's when he actually came across this land in vikroli and um he actually purchased this whole land uh, in a public auction that was organized by the government the british government of course then in 1943 and this whole track of land uh, then became uh part of godrej empire and then the whole godrej industrial township was started being built up from 43 onwards so here is actually a picture from 60s where only there are two plants and there is a railway line going in between uh and then of course pirot shah also thought about the welfare of his workers and he also started um the residential colony for them schools hospitals everything that was part of this whole township planning uh so this is how actually uh, the whole vikroli chapter started for <clears throat> godrej just a second yeah so this is actually uh, which actually brings us to uh, you know the period just before the independence or you know when we actually achieved independence so what really uh, you know happened after independence to uh, these industries <coughs> um so like you know so there are like many documents in our collection that actually really uh, reflect on many socio economic political events and the most important event that took place around the independence is of course partition and we never thought that you know these kind of documents would be available with us because we are like you know mumbai is very away from the northwest frontier which actually was witnessing the partition but then we came across these documents and they really tell you a lot because in 1949 two years after the independence uh, one of our sales manager is writing to all the uh, dispatch departments that you know now everything that we would be sending to karachi because we had a dealer in karachi then uh, has to have a label called made in india now this is a very small change that was taking place because earlier karachi was part of india and the dealers everything we had a network over there but now suddenly because the country was divided into two nations we have to now put made in india label while sending it to uh, karachi we also had to apply for the export license 
uh, but this uh, political event also had an impact on lots of people uh, who were working uh, you know on that side of the nation and suddenly there is one uh, circular which is again sent by Mr. R.K. Sanjana, the manager, and he is talking about a mechanic who used to work with our Karachi dealer, and he has decided to join, you know, the Indian uh, Union. And once he comes here, what kind of job options would be available for him? So therefore, this manager is writing to all our branches and the dealers whether you know you have any such opportunities for him because he's now coming here and he will of course need a job. Uh, and so these are the kind of impact that you see uh, of a particular political event that was taking place and then suddenly you know you are actually talking about it. There is also a very uh, kind of a touching circular that we found where Punjab National Bank is asking. Uh, the quick delivery of the safe deposit was because people were afraid of their belongings while you know uh, shifting their homes during the partition and they were depositing lots of their valuable with the bank so bank was actually in need of lots of safe deposit lockers and they were like insisting and emphasizing and writing to godrej that please send us as soon as possible you know uh, all these kind of lockers that we need now so these are the very interesting things that you look at uh, and understand that, you know, how actually even the company is part of this whole uh, thing that was happening and they cannot remain really isolated. And then, of course, this is a very interesting uh, product that went out of Vikroli. The first product that went out of Vikroli was the ballot box, uh, which was the special order uh, that was placed upon um, us by uh you know the functioning government then uh but just before the election we got this order to manufacture ballot boxes for the first election of independent india that were to take place from 51 and 52 and there was only one plant then which you can see here on this newspaper clipping uh that was plant one and the building still exists on the campus uh and where actually the whole ballot boxes actually started uh I can actually play this for you. Just let me know if you can hear it. Started mm -hmm. in Vikroli mm -hmm. making ballot boxes. Okay. Then we shifted. When we all shifted uh -huh. there, the big order for ballot boxes came in. Okay. Plant one was. Who else? Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know. Finally, how many ballot boxes we ended up by making about 15 or 17 lakhs or something like that. And at our best, I think we were producing about 22,000 ballot boxes okay. per day. Oh. And uh, old man, Firosha Bodrid, mm -hmm. promptly there at 3 o'clock every afternoon, oh. asking us how it is going and we would say, no problem, sir. So this is how actually, you know, um, the historical narrative cannot be really complete without these individual memories. Um, and therefore, when we interviewed Thaniwala, he was so excited to, you know, talk about this whole manufacturing of the ballot box. Um, and therefore, actually, you know, it is very much needed for every company to look at their employees as, uh, you know, the knowledge bearers, and they are actually, uh, you know, to be recorded. And because otherwise, you know, their experiences would just go out of the company once they resign or retire um, and therefore even at Godrej archives we are constantly uh, you know taking this up and recording experiences of our employees whoever has completed more than 20 years or 25 years we record their uh, you know valuable experiences as such um, so <clears throat> as i was talking about the tool room earlier so tool room actually really equipped Godrej uh, with a lot of confidence that they could actually come up with and uh, uh, to manufacture the products which were never even attempted by any other Indian company. And one such was the typewriter in the year 1955. <coughs> uh, typewriter actually at that point in time were only imported. Remington had a factory in Calcutta, uh, but Remington was a co US company. Uh, there were lots of UK based companies who were supplying the typewriters such as Royal. Uh, there was also another US company which was supplying Underwood. A uh, lot of European companies uh, were supplying other models like Halda. 
so if you see like you know only we were importing the typewriters then but then naval godrej came up with this idea that why you know uh, not you know why we cannot be self reliant even in this uh, industry and that's when actually he took this up this was actually quite challenging because godrej had no experience in such kind of a precision engineering because uh, you know godrej was used to do a sheet metal kind of a work whether it is a lock or a safe or a cupboard or a safe um, so that's why uh, you know when actually this was decided pirocha really asked him whether you know we will be able to make a really world class kind of a typewriter which would be as good as remington but naval godrej was confident enough and if you can see this second picture from the left where rajendra prasad is looking at the uh, typewriter the letters that if you cannot read it says india can make it means we today talk about self reliance in a very different way but in those days um, you know when uh, people like say um, you know uh, even nehru was actually envisaging india and he was looking at industries as the modern temples of india there was lot of uh, focus and emphasis on the indian industries and uh, <coughs> so the need was means there was actually the indian leadership like nehru believed in technology and progress in industrialization and machine and uh, the need was felt that for the sustained progress india must itself undertake to produce uh, what it needs uh, and uh, thus independence actually opened up different kinds of opportunities for indian industries uh, as you can see here for godrej through typewriters and uh, these industries really played a very important role in development of national capability so if you look at the period 50s 60s and 70s that actually laid the foundation uh, for a lot of indian industrial development and unfortunately we really do not talk about this period a lot uh, in our history books Uh, and even in fact, J R D Tata, while reflecting on this particular era, had also remarked that the performance of Indian economy from mid fifties and mid sixties reflected the soundness of mixed economy as originally conceived. Um, of course, this period was, um, you know, also had some challenging times in face of like there was acute steel shortage, and we have lots of documents about steel shortage um, because. all our products were actually uh, steel products uh, there was license raj there was import restrictions but in spite of that uh, if you see the industrial development that was taking place and the way companies were actually coming forward to align with the uh, leadership then uh, to actually uh, make lots of things possible for india and the typewriter was one such thing that godrej introduced and here you can see actually nehru typing on the machine even before we launched uh, just because our branch manager came to know that nehru had come to attend one congress meeting and you just rushed with the typewriter show him that this is india's first you know all indian typewriter and uh, that's how i think uh, you know even they advertised it then um and this typewriter of course had also like given rise to lots of ancillary industries like service mechanics came up the typists the street typists or even the typing classes that even today you will see at lots of places in mumbai very few but still they are emerging uh, this was also a period when godrej uh, didn't shy away from manufacturing another such product which was never done by indian companies and that was the forklift so godrej was the first to uh, introduced in 1963 and later tatas followed in 1964 uh, and within a de uh, you know i think uh, after a decade um, you know godrej also had like reached the uh, what you can say the standard where they were also back the first export order for the forklifts and here actually the contract is being signed between godrej and machino import moscow for supply of 50 numbers of forklift trucks and they were supplied in 1977 so when you are talking about indian products these indian industrialists made sure that it is also up to the mark it is also following the certain international standards as well and around this time also like uh, you know there is another thing that was opening up for indian industry and uh, you know in 60s the federation of malaysia was found, formed in 1963 and um, 
around this time, the Pioneer Industries Ordinance 1958 actually was also signed and they, it actually offered lots of industries, uh, you know, lots of inducements like five-year tax holiday, modest degree of tariff protection, all this was offered uh, through these Pioneer Industries Ordinance and that's when even Godrej actually started thinking on these lines and they set up their first factory abroad uh, in Malaysia uh, in the early 1960s. And um, uh, the factory was established in Johar Baru, which was at that time was at the center of this federation. But soon Singapore left in 1965 from that federation and Johar Baru was actually uh, you know, near the border of Singapore. And that's where the factory started manufacturing the furniture. But this is again another interesting incident that uh, Thanewala shared with us because we came across these photographs where women are actually on the shop floor and we had never seen women uh, anywhere in our photographs, especially at the Vikroli Township. So we asked him that, you know, whether these are Godrej pictures. And he said, yes, this is from Malaysia because they also started hiring men over there. But then there was one. Uh, you know, manager from uh, Fiat assembly plant uh, called Rene. And he actually had come to meet Mr. Thanewala. And he said that if you want to really profit uh, in Malaysia, don't hire men, start hiring women because they are actually, the productivity rate uh, is much higher in them. And uh, that's how actually, uh, you know, Malaysia plant started hiring women. And uh, so this is also very interesting to look at because how actually the local uh, conditions can actually make you change certain policies or, you know, of recruitment as well. Uh, and this is another, uh, you know, episode that also was taking place because suddenly there is a, uh, you know, foundation of the professional management education uh, was done in 1960s. And suddenly even Godrej thought that they should also go professional way. Uh, and at that time, they started hiring management trainees. And this is from IIM Ahmedabad Archives monthly snippets and where they have described that how, uh, you know, these management trainees, which were recruited in late 60s in Godrej, uh, you know, they were, um, uh, how they were encouraged, uh, you know, when they were actually performed well. Uh, you can actually look at also the IIM Archives uh, site, which is a very interesting archives um, talking about the institutional history and this whole change you know from the traditionally managed company to the professionally managed company you can actually see here after coming of these management trainees from six, late 60s onwards and uh, here you can see suddenly there is a change in the financial year of the company from calendar year to the fiscal year so these kind of changes started coming up we started regularly hiring management trainees from IIM Ahmedabad in those years. And this was also a period when lots of new uh, office spaces were coming up. We were also catering lots of furniture to these kind of new office spaces that were emerging. Nariman Point was being developed in 60s. And at that time, Godrej also uh, started entering into the architectural fabrication business. And here actually you can see lots of aluminum uh, framing windows and doors were supplied to lots of buildings that were coming up in India. Uh, to give you a few examples, the Hotel Trident, which uh, uh, the Oberoi's earlier, that had all the aluminium fabrication work done by Godrej. Uh, TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, had the aluminium fabrication done by Godrej. Even the Air India offices or even these Punjab National Bank, uh, Tungabhadra Powerhouse, so all these infrastructural projects that were coming up and even for the Cyrus reactor, the whole aluminum cladding was done by Godrej. So if you see like, you know, as India also like, you know, changed over a period of time, you can also see how, uh, you know, the company's journey also is taking place uh, in alignment with all those developments. And then, of course, the computers uh, were introduced in 70s. Uh, in the office spaces. Of course, the personal computers only came during the Rajiv Gandhi's regime uh, that was in 90s. Uh, but before that, you know, the professional computers had already uh, been there in 70s and 80s. And here actually we could get uh, from the interview which we had with another employee, Mr. P. N. Devdhar. And he spoke about this whole computer department that was set up in 70s. 
uh, and how the experience was because today we may not think about it 32k bytes uh, that's how the memory they were actually dealing with then um, so this is a really very interesting to see how even the office spaces have changed and there should be also a history of office spaces office environments because there actually a lot of people spend most of their time and we are not really chronicling that kind of a history that what really happens in office what really like you know kind of an office environment is and these kind of studies really need to be taken that how office culture how the hr policies how the processes have changed over a period of time because because of this computer that were introduced the, even the attendance system we had seen changing in godrej so there were token systems earlier then the data was fed into these kind of computers and then the salaries would be generated today we have swipe machine so how these kind of processes have evolved it could be a, a very wonderful study to actually look at and then of course the consumerism started uh, and lots of products uh you know the middle class actually their purchase power started increasing and that's how actually you know you see these kind of consumer products became really popular especially in 80s uh and that actually needed a lot of strong dealers network which also like this professional managers which uh, godrej started actually hiring they really started thinking about how to develop and penetrate the regional markets and navel godrej and dr hathi who actually initiated that program of recruiting from management institutes they actually traveled across india selected dealers and this dealer network in 80s was really strong and because of this dealers network even companies like ge were looking forward in 90s to collaborate with uh, godrej especially in the appliances because of the penetration that godrej enjoyed into the markets then uh, and then of course we have lots of interesting uh, dealer stories i won't go into details of this but even dealers actually have really very interesting uh, history because this is one uh, you know dealer from assam who actually shared his story that how his grandfather actually came when from rajasthan to assam when he heard about uh, you know oil was struck and it is really mind boggling because today in the google world you know that okay something happened in this corner we know but in those period like you know three generations before how actually a person sitting in rajasthan knows about that oil has been struck in assam and then he you know leaves everything in rajasthan and comes to assam just to sell that bucket full of oil uh, and how he actually you know starts his business and then goes into automobile dealership and then comes into the godrej dealership it is a fascinating entrepreneurial story that we actually started understanding when we started interacting with dealers and there are multiple such stories all across india about these small scale businessmen uh, and they are really very interesting to look at uh, the another thing that happened and you know i'm just like reaching towards conclusion um so this is actually a major contribution i must say that godrej had uh, during 70s because of the tool room because of the typewriter now godrej had the confidence into the precision engineering and around that time isro was looking for partners in indian industries because there was lots of restrictions on the foreign exchange uh, isro even if they wanted to take the technology from outside from the western world it was very expensive and therefore isro was trying to see that how we can develop it indigenously and at that time they needed support from the indian industries and they choose mtar from hyderabad and godrej from mumbai uh, to collaborate with they had actually a consortium uh, and then uh, they started giving uh, you know uh, placing orders for satellite components that started with in 1970s first actually the fractionating trees then satellite components and then godrej got the uh, order for manufacturing vikas engine for the satellite launching vehicle and um, by 93 we had already supplied the first vikas engine today we have supplied more than hundreds we are also into cryogenic engine godrej also developed lots of technologies for isro including rotary vacuum raising facility and expander which are not available in the world in not uh, you know in many countries in the world and it is really like a, a you know a proud thing for godrej to say that you know they have these two 
uh, technologies that they developed for uh, ISRO. And um, this is what we actually got to know from Mr. Datar. He is no more now, but we had interviewed him. And he said that, uh, you know, how they developed the expander in one fifth of the cost that US was offering for. They just learned the technology and they experimented over here under the guidance of ISRO engineers. And that's how they were successful. Here you can see Abdul Kalam taking one of the uh, deliveries um, when he was with DRDL. Uh, so now, of course, Godrej is manufacturing lots of uh, products for defense as well. So how actually from securing locks coming to securing the borders of the nation, Godrej had actually really uh, you know, covered the uh, really interesting kind of a graph and their journey is really quite an interesting uh, one. And, uh, but everything is actually, uh, you know, can only be chronicled if we start chronicling the history of people because uh, every company is made of people. People have contributed, people have made these products, you know, and people have actually planned these kind of processes, have applied the strategies, uh, are the brain behind it. So therefore, uh, people's stories is what something that, you know, archives is always, uh, interested and you know if you have seen and these are actually the Navganis who are the loaders who uh, actually carry the products from one place to the another so they are like the movers for us uh, and they are also working with Godrish this is the fourth generation third or fourth generation working with us and this is the first batch that joined in 40s and their story is also talking about Indian economy and about the role the migration plays uh, in economy uh, because they are from this uh, village called Fadadewadi near Pune. And uh, because, uh, you know, there was lots of dependence on the rains, uh, they couldn't really rely uh, on the, you know, farming for sustaining their lives. And therefore, they started looking out for jobs in the industrial towns and the cities like Mumbai. And they came to Mumbai and they started working with Godrej. And then, of course, like three generations uh, in a row, they are working with Godrej still. So, and then now, of course, uh, you know, in later years, Godrej developed them as the entrepreneur. So now they are like movers and the transport suppliers. So they have now become vendors to the Godrej. So, you know, by being a worker in the company to this journey, I think it's a very interesting graph to look at and how actually they themselves also contributed to their own village is also quite an interesting story to look at. So how actually, you know, these connections, uh, histories can make to different kinds of things is really, uh, you know, wonderful to look at. And this is really evident, you know, if you have seen like how external events and how even the stakeholders have an enduring impact on the character of the business, you know, because the business's character is being shaped by these people, these events that are taking place around and, <clears throat> This whole constant interaction between the society and the corporate entity actually can help uh, get a better understanding of a corporate landscape of any nation. And hence, uh, I would again say that, you know, corporate history is not just a single story of a single business group, but it is actually the collection of stories bringing forth the multiple perspectives of corporate life. And, you know, the information available in diverse form, it may be correspondence, catalogs, advertisements, packaging, memorabilia, these are really valuable sources of historical, uh, you know, information and to understand the corporate past of the country on a macro level and that of the company at a very micro level. Uh, and therefore, the comprehensive understanding of history really is very important through all these sources. And that's how actually one can understand and dig deeper into the corporate ethos and that's what actually will make the future managers to take informed decisions if they are aware of all these connections with the past. And on this note, actually, uh, I would like to conclude hoping uh, that the business history gets its due place in the management curriculum as well. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you so much, uh, Brinda, ma'am, for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, it was uh, very, very enlightening and in terms of bridging the gap, which basically known uh, between industry academia kind of a relationship. 
so as i was having a discussion with one of the professor in our history department where she mentioned that history is not an alien subject whatever wherever whichever discipline you go history is there and today actually you have put your words accordingly and make it clear now uh, the session is open for question and answer so uh, any of our audience who wants to ask the question to brinda ma'am may kindly uh, put it on the chat box or raise your hand we will provide the mic to you so uh, vrinda ma'am one uh, uh, mm -hmm. suggestion i need from your side yeah. uh, as i handle the campus placement of my institutions mm -hmm. and here i uh, i understood that how i am amdabad was the one who pioneered and then godres took it further so how uh, you suggest the management institutions placement cell to incorporate uh, the mindset of this young managers Uh, to come and start making their career in the men business history perspective um means you mean to say the uh, career in business history or career in management uh ma'am career in business history of course see i would actually say uh, even if you are not really doing a career in business history i think you know even realizing the importance of business history while taking the managerial decisions i think that's something which all the management people or any any person who is working in this kind of corporate environment should look at because i think you know what to, when we talk about history it is not just about the nostalgia but what i am talking when i say history it is actually more like a historical thinking you know like you have to put this thinking to the problem solving methods that you might be applying in your corporate life and you know how actually you will arrived at the informed decision is by actually tracing uh what had happened before in such partic you know in particular situations like these if they are facing anything uh you know what product might have worked in the past what you know how the markets have behaved in the past how they will now so all these kind of you know connections that the management people have to make so you know like career in business history would depend on you know what kind of interest that person has so i may not be you know the right person to talk about it but what i would say that you know looking at history don't really like you know uh, you know say it or brush it away by saying that it is about past it is actually not just about the past you are not really looking backwards and this is the constant lament even we hear from the lot of managers that you know we don't want to look back we want to go ahead but then it is like a rear view mirror you know you you don't have to like look back but you have to keep constantly looking at the rear view mirror so that you know your journey on the road is safe uh and that's something i think you know every manager should understand that historical thinking and use history as a tool to have a informed decision so that you can actually reimagine the future of the company in a better way so it's not really like you know making career in business history but applying the historical thinking to whatever you are doing is i think currently what we need because uh, most of the problems that india today is facing is because we are not really learning from it uh and that's something you know i would just like to say that over here agree ma'am so ma'am i can see there is a question uh, from nandita moitra dr nandita moitra ma'am and uh, ma'am is asking that if there is any archival material on contribution of godrej company to environmental conservation uh yeah very few actually um, you know the whole uh, the department means we actually have lots of files where when the industrial township was being set up and they actually were taking conscious decision of how you know the environment needs to be built uh, how it should be the green environment um, there are very few records right now uh, because some of the departments you know uh, as it happens like they have thrown away certain records because they had no space uh, but we have actually lots of uh, records and especially like uh now because there is an awareness uh you know a lot of awards that they have won for example we have in our collection uh indira gandhi paryavaran puraskar that godrej had uh, received uh for their contribution to the environment uh even like there are few records where actually how uh, the whole mangroves that are being like right now conserved by godrej which are adjacent to their um, you know whole vikroli campus uh and part of their whole property 
but how they are actually maintaining it, preserving it, and actually conserving it, all those, all that kind of a data is available. But we have very few uh, documents related to it, but yes, but we have um, enough to like showcase what kind of contribution Godrich has made. Uh, there okay. is another question about archival material in on banking sector. Um, actually, because Godrej uh, wasn't really into the banking sector, we don't have much. But wherever we have supplied uh, to the banks, the products like safes or the safe deposit vaults, even the testimonials that we get from a lot of banks, uh, those are the things that we have. For example, the brochure that you have seen of Central Bank of India, uh, those kind of things we have. So wherever we were actually interacting with banks, uh, that material we have, or wherever we have supplied to the banks, that kind of archival material we uh, have. And some of the, uh, you know, Times of India newspaper clippings that talk about the whole safe deposit lockers, the advertisements, uh, those kind of things, uh, you know, we have, which actually indirectly talk about the banking sector. Uh, but not means the bank records would be there with the banks only, but only wherever we have actually interacting with them. Uh, about that, we have uh, the archival material. Yes. Uh, even I can see Nita ma'am's comment is also there. There was a oh, book yes. on Mangroves published by Godrej. And yes. Brinda ma'am, you are one of the editors in English and Marathi. That's what uh, she has mentioned. Yeah. Actually, very long time back that was published. Uh, there was a, a book on flora and fauna of mangroves. And I think it's a very interesting compilation, um, you know, to look at. But now, of course, mangroves has an app. So you can actually check all the flora and fauna on the app itself. So, yeah. Okay, so it's uh, now the time for uh, concluding the session. So I request our today's chairperson, Dr. Smita Shukla ma'am, to give her chairperson remarks. Over to you, Smita ma'am. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Am, am, uh, okay. Uh, I could finally hear after you know, changing the setting of my phone. So I could hear you, Vrinda, madam, talking all along, okay? And uh, enjoyed every minute of the uh, session, whatever you spoke about, and you uh, gave the overview of relevance of business history, even while answering the questions, you uh, uh, conveyed in your response the same, that as a business management student, why it is important and, and, and what, what it adds uh, in terms of value. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, as, as a faculty who teaches business management, I feel what is also important for us is to set any kind of you no know, business decision, problem solving exercise in context of the history. This entire process which we discuss about you no know, teaching business management uh, through case study approach, in fact, is based on the historical context. No case studies without you no know, some some kind of you no know, historical connect. People who have done something, solved problems, have been in some situations which have business context, it is only on those that the case studies are written. When we refer to the business research, business research again brings in historical context. There are multiple theories in business management which comes from historical context. Say, for example, when we refer to uh, no, uh, 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 the theory of diamond model, which is Porter's diamond model, it is based on historical context and surveys of several industries and how they performed then no uh, in, in in terms of that context the national advantage which so I think when you refer to business history, it has so much of relevance uh, in management education. Only thing is conveying this that why it is important and that you could do beautifully in your session. Uh, thank you so much, madam. It has added a lot of value to the management students and to our institution. Every word which you have spoken, I believe that we will cherish for a long time to come. Thank you so much for being here, madam, today. Thank you so much, Smita, ma'am, for your wonderful remark and giving lots of confidence uh, to us uh, for making lots of exploration in terms of doing lots of programs in regards to multidisciplinary perspective. 
so business history was one of the attempt which uh, as an institution uh, we had tried to build it up and it's very successful to hear uh, Vrinda Patare ma'am's words about not only the 125 years of history of Godrej but also the history of business history. So I retweet the word of Lord Acton who says that history is not a burden on the memory but an illumination of the soul. So while hearing Brinda ma'am, you have not only given us the importance of plant product and process of Godrej as a company, but you also help us to meet those stalwarts who played a very important role for shaping Godrej as a very successful organization. So thank you once again, Brinda ma'am for accepting our invitation and being here with us. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Smita Shukla ma'am who never say no to me whenever I go to her with any new proposal and immediately Madam say yes, why not? And this is how today we came up with the series of Azadi Ke Amrit Mahotsav and Brinda ma'am, you have become the opening batsman for us and such a wonderful inning you have played today while delivering a wonderful session in our today's program. I'm also very thankful to all my students team, the UCC of Mumbai University for providing us the Zoom platform for organizing uh, this, pro for helping us to organize this program, very successful. I'm also very thankful uh, to the respected faculty colleagues from different colleges and especially in University Nita Khanpekar ma'am from History Department University of Mumbai. Prof. Dr. Ramesh Yamgar, sir, uh, from uh, Goregaon Patkar College. We have the faculty here from Ruya College and Dr. Nandita Moitra, ma'am, also present over here with the team of students. Thank you each and everyone for being over here with us, for making this program a very successful. I'm also very thankful to my department faculty colleagues who are here today to understand the business history from uh, Vrinda Patare, ma'am, uh, your expertise and your perspective. Thank you once again, everybody to join us. And uh, with this, uh, we are very thankful once again to you, ma'am. And Smita, ma'am, with your permission, uh, we may declare the end of our today's program. Yes, please go ahead. Once again, from my side, my heartfelt thanks to uh, Vrinda, madam. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. I request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form, which I have already posted on the chat box. And after a few seconds, I will end the meeting. Thank you, Vrinda. <laughs> we will just have a group photograph. Yes. May I request uh, every participants to kindly on your paper, which we will also cherish in our memories. Thank you. Mansi, can you do this? I am also clicking, but I also request. Done, Mansi. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, Samina, ma'am, I can see your hand is raised now. Yes, Samina, ma'am, I can hear you. 